Praise the Lord. We want to consider something very important from the Word of God. But before we look into it, can we just have a brief moment of prayer? Our Father, we bless your name. We worship you. We exalt your name because you are great and greatly to be praised. Lord, we pray even as we look at something very important from your Word. We pray you teach us your Word and give us understanding in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This day we'll be looking at the topic, the reality of God's safety. The reality of God's safety. We'll be looking at, at our text, the book of Psalm chapter 1 to 4 from verse 1 to 8. Psalm chapter 1 to 4 from verse 1 to 8. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up quick. When their wrath was kindled against us, then the waters had overwhelmed us, the stream had gone over our soul, then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who had not given us as a prey to their teeth. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fathers. The snare is broken and we are escaped. As hell, our hell is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. You can see this place is talking about the reality of God's safety. God's safety is sure. God's safety, God does not advertise before people can come to Him. Ordinarily, when they see and hear about others who were faced from Satan, who were faced with um, satanic attacks, afflictions, and bondages, they will want to give it a try. Yes, if what happened to them can also happen in their life, this shows that God's safety is hundred percent guarantee. As long as you bring your guarantor, which is Jesus Christ, yes, when you bring Jesus Christ, your guarantor, your safety is guaranteed. The Bible says, as many as will call unto, come unto Him. He will in no wise cast away. This means that you must accept Christ into your uh, into your heart and life if you really want to experience the divine safety of God. Again, God's safety is real. God's safety is not just what you read in the Bible. Well, the Bible is also real, but you know, take a look around to see all those who are in Christ Jesus, how much safety the Lord is giving unto them. This is as a result of their partnership with Christ. They partner with Christ. They partner with God. They are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, they live. Yet not them, but Christ are living them. You can see those people have uh, their heirs of God and their joint heirs with Christ. And so they will also have the uh, privilege, the unlimited privilege to the inheritance of the kingdom. We'll be looking at three things as we look into this uh, subject, as we look into this topic. The first thing we'll be looking at is the first point is the unconditional stand of God by our side, the unconditional stand of God by our side. You can see here the psalmist was talking about the safety, the safety of the godly. He was talking about the reality of God's safety. And that reality of God's safety brings about the unconditional stand of God by our side. God will always stand by us. When we need someone to stand by us and everybody uh, desert us, I will look as if we are forlorn. God will surely stand by us. That's what is why the psalmist said in Psalm chapter 1 to 4, in verse 1 and 2. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us. When men rose up against us, when everybody rose up against us, they rose up against us to eat us up, to swallow us up. But you see, God stood by us. He's a great God. This shows, this shows that God is with us always. And He doesn't demand, He doesn't demand anything from us. He gives us His short safety free of charge. Yes, He gives us free of charge, just as we breathe in air freely. We breathe in air freely. That is how our safety also is. The only prerequisite to enjoy His sure and real safety is to bring your grandfather, which is Jesus Christ, because even Jesus Christ has uh, said that He is the way, He is the truth, and the life. And no man comes unto the Father except through Him. This means that He is the passage towards uh, we enjoying the reality 
or of God's uh, safety. We'll be looking at seven things under this point. Under this point, one, the first thing we'll be looking at is God's faithfulness to protect servant. God's faithfulness to protect servant. Yes, God is faithful, and He will surely protect servant. He will surely protect those who are serving Him. He will not leave them to just go comfortless. He will not leave them to just go unprotected, vulnerable. Never. He will surely protect His own. In Psalm 91, from verse 1 to 15, we'll be reading selected verses. He that dwelleth in the sovereign place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noise of pestilence. He shall cover me with his feathers, and under his wings shall I tr shall thou trust. His shoe shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that fly by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasted at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand. But it shall not come near thee. Only with thy eyes shall I behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is thy refuge, even the most high the habitation, there shall no evil before thee, neither shall any plague come near thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shall not trample on thy feet, because he has set his love upon thee, therefore will he deliver thee. He will set thee on high because ha you have known his name, because he had known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. You can see, God has promised, and he will never fail. He will surely protect his servant from the pestilence flying in the day, and from the arrows flying in the night. He will also protect his servant from anything that will harm them. Whether, uh, whether fear or demonic uh, projection, he is able to protect. The second thing we'll be looking at under this point is God's fullness to provide surplus. Yes, God has so much fullness, he has so much limitlessness to provide surplus. The, uh, we'll be looking at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 and 21 you see here what he's talking about now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in worketh in us unto him be glory in the church by christ jesus throughout all ages world without end amen you can see where that place is telling us talk, talking about the father god has that fullness he has that limitlessness that abundance to provide surplus unto us. And we look at Ephesians chapter 3, in verse 11 to 13. You see what it says? According to the eternal purpose, which is proposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him, wherefore I desire that ye faint not at, at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. You can see that. You can see that, that God has so much abundance and bountifulness to uh, provide us surplus. In Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy also confirms that. In Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 28, Deuteronomy 28, from verse 2 to 6. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shall thou be in the city, and blessed shall thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket, and thy store. Blessed shall thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shall thou be when thou goest out. You can see that God are uh, protecting us, God are uh, uh, making us sure that we are preserved and safe. He's also providing for us whatever we need. You can see that's talking about God's our fullness to provide. God does not lack anything. In fact, He has everything because He's the creator of the whole world. And whatsoever you, His creature, ask the Father in the name of Jesus, He will give it unto you. The third thing we'll be looking at under this point one is God's friendliness to pacify souls. God's friendliness to pacify souls. Yes, 
God is also friendly in as much as he wants to preserve us, in as much as he wants to save us, he also wants to save us in eternity. In as much as he wants to save us uh, physically from harm, from hurt, he also wants to save us in eternity. God's friendliness to pacify, to pacify souls, that is to forgive, to forgive souls. Matthew 11, Matthew 11, in verse 28 to 30, Matthew chapter 11, from verse 28, to 30 Matthew chapter 11 from verse 28 to 30 come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls for my yoke is easy and my body is light you can see there's a divine transaction here you need in the trade and battle system one good is exchanged for another good so you can see one one thing here is exchange for another thing that is we give jesus our sins we drop our sin at the foot of his cross and we collect his salvation we receive his salvation you can see that that's a divine exchange a divine transaction there you can see god is not willing that any should perish but that all should come unto repentance if only the unrepentant if only the uh the the those who have not surrendered if only the unrepentant can come unto jesus those who have not surrendered their lives unto Jesus Christ, if only they can come unto the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ will give them rest from their loads of sin. The fourth thing we're looking at here is God's freshness to prolong songs. God's freshness to prolong songs. God has enough freshness to prolong, to preserve, to uh, lengthen, lengthen, and to promote their longevity. God has enough freshness to accomplish that. In Psalm 91 verse 16, with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Psalm 118 verse 17, you see what the scripture says there. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. You can see that is God's freshness. God is ever fresh. He never grows nor deteriorates. He cannot become stale, our God is unchangeable, and He has promised long life unto those who hearken unto His command, unto His commandment. The uh, fifth thing we'll be looking at here is, under this point, is God's fierceness to punish sinners. Yes, yeah, some people say God is merciful, but they leave out the fact that God is also a consuming fire, that God, uh, when anyone commits sin, God will bring on, on God will unleash judgment upon such a and one. They fail to uh, include that. You see, God's fierceness to punish sinners. In Revelation chapter 20, God's fierceness. God's fierceness to punish sinners. Revelation 20, in verse 14 and 15. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found, whosoever was not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of of fire you can see and in 21 verse 27 chapter 21 verse 27 you see what the scripture says and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth neither whatsoever worketh abomination or make it a lie but they which are written in the lamb's book of life and you can see in 22 chapter 22 in verse 15 chapter 22 verse 15 for without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie, you can see those people who conspired, uh, they make a lie and they deal dishonestly. You can see those people, such one, such people will eventually end up at the other side of eternity, at the lake of fire. You see, Matthew 25 also gives us that, confirms that to us. In Matthew 25, in verse 41, Matthew 25 from verse 41, you see. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, that is, those who are goats, they are goats, they disobey the will of the master, they are stubborn to come unto the knowledge of the truth. They are stubborn to use the, the word the Lord has given unto them to, to accept him, to serve him, to surrender unto him. They are stubborn to do that. What will happen to them? He said, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil, and is angels you can see you can see that these people these people are those who are not saved these people will be cast those people will experience the fierceness of god they are those who are not saved and they'll be down they'll be down they'll be trodden in the wine press of the fierceness of the wrath of god and then 
The next thing we'll be looking at is uh, the sixth thing we'll be looking at under the same point is God's fairness, God's fairness, that is God's, uh, uh, God's impeccability, uh, God's uh, uh, fault, uh, flawlessness, God's fairness to pronounce sagacity. Then sagacity there means judgment. God's fairness to pronounce sagacity. Now, uh, you can see what the scripture says in the book of Acts. God's fairness. He has committed all judgment to, to his son. And he has that fairness. He has that uh, equal equality. He has that equality. It is without prejudice. It is without bias. He does not judge in a uh, biased way. He is fair in judgment. He has equality in judgment. In uh, the book of Acts, chapter 17, Acts chapter 17, in verse, Acts chapter 17, in verse 31, Acts chapter 17, in verse 31, let's back up to verse 30. At the times of this ignorance, God winked out, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent, because, in verse 31, because he had appointed a day in the which he would judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he had ordained, whereof he had given assurance unto all men in that he had raised him from the dead. You can see that is talking about God's fairness to pronounce sagacity. He has committed the judgment unto his son already. Jesus Christ is the one to judge, and so his judgment is just. Our God is an incorruptible, impartial judge. You can see God's, uh, there is no contradiction to the diction of God's jurisdiction. There is no contradiction to the diction of God's jury, jurisdiction. His, his jurisdiction is without a flaw. You cannot change the diction of God's jurisdiction. His ju jurisdiction is without a flaw and he doesn't compromise. He has given all judgment unto his son and his judgment is just. The seventh thing we'll be looking at here is God's thoughtlessness to preserve saints. Yes, God's faultlessness. He does not fail in that. He's faultless. He's impeccable in that. He's unimpeachable in that. He's faultlessness. God's faultlessness to preserve sin. Let's look at Jude. Jude verse 24. Just one chapter. Jude in verse 24. Let's look at what that scripture tells us in Jude verse 24. You see what it says? Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. You can see that. Let's read verse 25. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. You can see that if God is not faultless, he will not be able to, uh, if God is not faultless, he will not be able to present, uh, if Jesus is not faultless, he will not be able to present uh, one faultless uh, before God. You can see his, his faultlessness that make it possible to preserve saints unto the heavenly kingdom. Yes, he's able to preserve saints unto the heavenly kingdom. He's able to save them presently in this present world and he's able to save them in eternity at, at, at the end of the world. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4, in chapter 2 Timothy chapter 4 in verse 18, let's look at what the scripture tells us there. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever amen you can see the lord will deliver uh me the lord will deliver every one of us from every evil work and will preserve us unto his heavenly kingdom to him be glory forever and ever amen god will surely preserve the saints he will not count his saints among the child that will be bound uh, with unquenchable fire. Instead, they will count the saint worthy to enter into his kingdom on the final day. This shows his impeccability. This shows his faultlessness. We'll be looking at the second point now. The second point is the unprecedented swallow of great waters over our soul. The unprecedented swallow. You can see this is a great swallow. It is it's not just, it's an unexampled swallow. You can see it's, an, it's a swallow that is so great and so remarkable that some is have to testify about this. You see that was right saying in Psalm 124, in Psalm 124, uh, in verse 3, in verse 3, uh, four, 3 to 5 now, Psalm 124, in verse 3 to 5, you see what he said, Then they had swallowed us up quick 
when their wrath was kindled against us, then the waters have overwhelmed us. The stream had gone over our soul. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. What are these proud waters? You can see, Samus was just using this as uh, as a kind of uh, a, a proud waters, that's a, a kind of personification. Uh, it's just like you saying a smiley sun, an angry wind, a proud water. You can see proud waters, just like a personification. What are these proud waters? You can see this shows how great the waters over our soul are. You can see the psalmist used water to symbolize the enemies. He used water to symbolize the enemies who came to oppose him on a regular basis. That was why he said the waters overwhelmed us. We'll be looking at three things here to look at what this water uh, are and what we what will be our position after we have received the reality we have received assurance of the reality of God's uh, safety uh, the first thing we'll be looking at here is the overwhelming flood the overwhelming flood what is this overwhelming flood in the book of Psalm chapter 6 to 1 Psalm chapter 6 to 1 from verse 1 to 8 Psalm 61 from verse 1 to 8 hear my cry O God attend unto my prayer from the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed lead me to the rock that is higher than high you can see now when my heart is overwhelmed overwhelmed by those proud waters lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. You can see that. You can see it's also uh, the Bible says in, in, in one of in the book of Proverbs. You see, uh, uh, it says that uh, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and is safe and secure. The righteous run into it and is safe and secure. So you can see the when enemies uh, pursue the saints, the saints. The only result, the only continual result of the saint is in the name of the Lord. Yes, that is the uh, the strong tower. Uh, you see what it says in verse 4, I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. For thou, O God, hast had my vows. Thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. Thou will prolong the king's life. You can see that that has already been assured. And his years as many generations. He shall abide before God forever. O prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. So will I sing praise unto thy name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. You can see that this describes the number of enemies that rise up against the believers. But instead of panicking, instead of being afraid, because the Lord has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, let us be of good cheer, because the Lord will cause them to be smitten before our face in Jesus name. The second thing we'll be looking at here is the overpowering foe. The overpowering foe. Who are these uh, people? Who are these enemies? Let's look at Psalm 64 in verse 1 to 10. Hear my voice, O God, in my prayer. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. You can see that. You can see that not only did these people uh, come to David to, uh, to hurt him or to harm him, they also came to threaten him so as to make him afraid. They also came to threaten him so as to make him to begin to fear them. You can see that that's what the enemy does, to frighten one so as to make one uh, weakened even when uh, he has not attacked physically. He wants to make one to be weakened psychologically and to make one to be frightened emotionally. You can see that was why David was making this prayer and he was bringing his complaint before God and so that God could rise up for his help. And I pray that as we also bring our complaint before God, the Lord will rise up for our help and all our enemies will be smitten before our face in Jesus' name. Look at what he says in verse 2. Hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked, from the insurrection of the workers of iniquity, who wet their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words, that they may shoot in secret at the perfect Suddenly the day shoot at him and fear not. They encourage themselves in an evil matter. They commune of laying snares privily. They say, Who shall see them? They search out iniquities. They accomplish diligent, a diligent search. Both the inward thought of every one of them and the heart is deep. But God shall shoot at them. You can see now. This is the assurance we are getting, but God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly shall they be wounded. Amen. 
so they shall make their own tongue to fall upon themselves, all that see them shall flee away, and all men shall fear and shall declare the work of God, and uh, for they shall wisely consider of his doing. The righteous shall be glad in the Lord, and shall trust in him, and all the upright in heart shall glory. You can see that this describes the unbending enemies who don't want to give up. They don't want to give up. They are persistent in their stubbornness uh, until they destroy, they, until they destroy the believers, until they recover our work in their lives. They uh, they continue to uh, uh, wet their tongue. You see, they continue to wet their tongue. They are persistent in their evil. Let us bear in mind that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is our consolation in time of tribulation, in a time such as this. And let us seek the face of God and call upon the name of the Lord, and we will be saved. We will be saved, we will be delivered, we will be set free. In Psalm chapter 27, Psalm chapter 27, let's look at what the scripture says there. In Psalm chapter 27, David also make a conflict before God. And God answered him, Psalm 27, from verse 1 to 14. But we will be reading selected verses. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Who is the strength of your life? Who is the strength of the believer's life? It is the Lord. When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. They stumbled and fell. We'll, back up to, we'll move to verse 10 now. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Yes, when father and mother forsake one, who should one now resort to? God is the, is the last resort, and God will take one up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of my enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of my enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breath out cruelty. In verse 13, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You can see that. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. In verse 14, wait on the Lord. You can see that instead is giving he has seen the goodness of God, he has seen the work of God, the power of God, and now he's giving us a command. He said, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Is there any result? Is there any uh, uh, is there any uh, advantage of waiting on the Lord? Is there any result? Uh, there's a result. In the third thing we are looking at is the overcoming flock. Yes, the result is that we will overcome. John 16, verse 33, when we wait on the Lord, even the Bible says, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. So we we'll look at John 16, verse 33, now he said, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We are the sheep. Jesus Christ is the shepherd. So Jesus Christ has overcome the world already. He's our shepherd, and we are to follow him. The sheep follow uh, follow the shepherd whithersoever he goes. So we are not to follow our own way, but the way of the shepherd. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the one that directs us to God. He's the one that reconciles us back to God. So he's our master. He's the one we are to follow. And so because our master has overcome, we also will overcome. Anything short of overcoming, is not to be our portion. Therefore, we kick them out from our lives, anything short of overcoming. And we say, because our master overcame, we say we should be of good cheer because we also will, will overcome. Matthew chapter 10, you see what Matthew chapter 10, verse 23, verse 28 to 23, to 33 says, Matthew chapter 10, from verse 28 to 33, Matthew 10 today. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye have more value than many sparrows. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father in heaven, which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, 
him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. You can see that. So Jesus Christ has told us that we should not fear. We should not fear those who will just kill the body, but they are not able to kill the soul. But rather, we should fear him which is able to kill and destroy both soul and body in hell. So we are overcomers already we are overcomers and we should claim that triumph we should claim that victory in every area of our life jesus christ has assured us already that uh we he has overcome the world he said we should be of good cheer because he has overcome the world already so if you if jesus christ overcame it means that we also will overcome and we will overcome as god's faithful flock in Jesus name the third point we'll be looking at now the third point is the undisputed safety of God's people from the snare the undisputed safety this is incontrovertible this is uh, indubitable it is not to be debated because the Lord will save us amen the Lord will deliver us it will make us to be liberated to be delivered to be saved from the snare of the fathers, from the snare of the enemies. We should note that it is only those who have surrendered their lives unto the Lord Jesus, only those who have surrendered their lives unto the Lord Jesus Christ that will be free to enjoy the free safety of God. You see, those are the only people who will be uh, able to enjoy the free safety of God. Let's look at Psalm 124. Psalm 1 to 4, in verse 6 to 8 now. Psalm 1 to 4, verse 6 to 8. Blessed be the Lord who had not given us as a prey to their teeth. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Our help, in verse 8, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Who is our help in? Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Therefore, it is imperative that a sinner repents so that he can also enjoy this reality of God's safety. We'll be looking at three things uh, in this uh, point, point three. We'll be looking at three things. The first thing we'll be looking at is our great entanglement to sin. Sin is a great hindrance toward us receiving the goodness of God. Until we repent from our sin, until we acknowledge that we have sinned and we repent from that, those sins, we will continue to remain in entanglement. We will continue to remain in defeat. We will continue to remain in, in, in destitution. But when we recognize the redemptive power in the name of Jesus, in the blood of Jesus, we will be saved. When we call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's look at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. In verse 23, look at what the scripture says. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have come short of the glory of God. You can imagine the, the enormity of the deformity, the enormity of the deformity, that largeness, that greatness of, of the sin that was, we committed, the sin of disobedience. The disobedience of one man brought about the death of the, everyone in the world. And so the obedience of the other man, the last Adam, which is Jesus Christ, brought about a quickening, a, a, a resuscitation from deadness, from every form of spiritual, um, spiritual, uh, uh, spirit, uh, spiritual uh, gridlock. And so you see Romans chapter 7, verse 24, you say, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? What the apostle was lamenting. He said, O wretched man that I am. He, re he realized, he recognized that he had been in sin. And so he, in verse 25, now he said, Thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. You can see that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But with the help of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, that great entanglement can be broken because Jesus Christ has redeemed man from the cause of the law through his power of resurrection. And from henceforth, we will no longer be servant to sin, but to righteousness. Only Jesus Christ can actualize this. Let us come unto him. The second thing we'll be looking at here is our gracious escape from Satan. This shows that by grace through faith we are delivered from every walk, from every evil walk, and from the powers of darkness. 
if we are begotten of God, we will keep ourselves and that wicked one, the devil, will not be able to touch us or to do us any harm. Let's look at Romans 6. Let's look at what it says in Romans chapter 6, in verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mother body, that ye should obey it in the laws thereof. You can see when you do not allow sin to reign in your mother body, no evil will come near you. In verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. Yes. We should not allow sin because the wages of sin is dead, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in verse 14, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Yes, when you do not allow sin to have dominion over you, you will be preserved, you will be saved, you will be set free from all the works, from all the devices of the wicked. In the third thing we'll be looking at here is our glorious extrication. Our glorious extrication from this near. Yes, Jesus Christ is the one who has saved us. He's the one who has emancipated us from the dungeon of darkness to the marvelous light of uh, of God. And you can see, you can, if you look at Colossians chapter, you look at what the Scripture tells us in Colossians chapter one. Colossians chapter one. I read. From verse 10, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto our pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. In verse 11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. In verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. We cannot be partakers of that inheritance in darkness. So Jesus Christ has brought us out of that darkness, and we are partakers of the inheritance in light. And then in verse 13 now, who had delivered us from the power of darkness? Who did that? It's Jesus Christ. And that we translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. God did that through Jesus Christ. God made that provision for our salvation. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, we have that redemption. Look at it in verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. So through the blood of Jesus, we have forgiveness. As many that will come unto him, he will no wise cast away. When we accomplish that, when we are able to get that, then we will have that inheritance. We will be partakers of the inheritance in the light of the Savior. This shows that the snare is broken. The snare, the we, we are broken loose of everything that binds us up. Every snare, every negativity, everything that binds us up, we are broken loose of everything and we are now free. We are free from the snare of the Father and from the noisome pestilence. The snare is broken and our soul is escaped. Our soul is escaped from the snare of the fathers through the work, the redemptive work of God through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Why not go to the Lord in prayer now? The, the topic once again is the reality of God's safety. The reality of God's safety. This safety of God is real. This safety of God is not a story that is told somewhere. It is real. And when God saves us, the reality of his safety is that it is unconditional. God's safety or by our side is unconditional. He is faithful to protect servants. He is full. He, is full. he has the abundance to supply us. He said, but my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And he has that friendliness to pacify souls. He will not cast away those souls that will come unto him. He will always give every sinner that that uh, that call that call unto repentance if the sinner accept if ye be willing and obedient ye shall eat the good of the land if the sinner accept the sinner will eat the good of the land that sinner will also will come unto the salvation of the lord but if ye rebel that sinner reject the message of salvation ye shall be devoured with the soul for the mouth of the lord has spoken the gods has that freshness to prolong songs that is those who have come unto the kingdom, they are now sons of God, they are now children of God. He has that freshness, continual freshness to prolong their lives, to guarantee their longevity. That is, they will no longer die young, but they will live to declare the works of the Lord. And so he has that fierceness also. 
Uh, we talk about God's mercy, but do we talk about him as a consuming fire? He has that fierceness to also punish sinners. He has that fierceness to pronounce sagacity, to pronounce judgment. He has that faultlessness to preserve sins. Let us go before the Lord in prayer now and tell him that is the reality of his safety will be evident in our lives.